Good morning. Good morning. Um, this is the first in a series of post-tenure review talks, and in, for those who are kind of uninitiated, uh, the museum, uh, uh, once they uh, tenure a curator, every seven years uh, they have to get up in front of you and give a nice talk about what they did over the last seven years, and, and they have to uh, show their peers uh, yeah, in a review what they did over the last seven years. So this is uh, Nancy's multiple seven-year review talk. Uh, she was appointed as an assistant curator in, in 1993, and she's been head of uh, curator in charge of mammalogy for 19 years now, and she was effectively the inaugural uh, uh, chair of vertebrate zoology and had that position for about 11 years. Uh, she has a very distinguished record and I'm going to really just talk over the last seven years because that's what's relevant for this review. Over this last seven years she's had a remarkable record. Uh, Co-advised six PhD students, eight postdocs, uh, she's had been part of around seven NSF grants over the last uh, uh, number of years. Um, and she's been an intense presence in undergraduate and REU type e e education. Over the last seven years, she's published around 50 papers that are either published or in press. And uh, Everybody knows that she's the world expert on bats. She published uh, uh, two books, co-authored two books on bats, one of which, uh, Bats, uh, Science and uh, Evolution. Um, no, is that right? I'm trying to remember the name of the book. Uh, ah, Bats, A World of Science and Mystery. It is, I think, one of the most spectacular books I've seen uh, of uh, for the general public on, on any group of mammals. It's, it's really nice, and I think we'll hear a lot about it today. Nancy's been on just innumerable committees in, in the museum, um, uh, in and out of RGS and uh, in, uh, the Senate and the museum at large. Um, but something on her CV actually struck me, and, and it just all of a sudden just called memories back. Because many times I've been walking in a you know, rainforest by myself or out in some other kind of forest by myself, and I'm saying, what the hell would happen to me if I fell down a ravine or got bitten by a snake? And, and who's gonna be there to save my butt? And then I saw on her CV, she would be the person that I would want with me in the wilderness. She would definitely be the person because she's had very recent uh, expert wilderness uh, and medical training for wilderness. And she is a certified instructor in the Boy Scouts of America. And what two things could you want from somebody? She's a decisive person. She takes charge, she knows what she wants to do, and she's had all that training to get you uh, to safety. That's what really stuck with me in her, in her CV. It was there in her CV. So uh, it is a great pleasure. She has been a tremendous, tremendous uh, curator within the division. She's helped me tremendously with her wisdom and, and knowledge about uh, what goes on around this place. And I think it's going to be a terrific uh, t talk to hear about bats. They're really, really cool animals. So Nancy Simmons. Thanks. Can you all hear me? OK, great. So today I'm going to talk about um, a field research program that I've had going on in Belize for about the last eight years. So. You all know where Belize is, a small country on the Caribbean coast, and the place that we work is associated with an archaeological reserve named Lamini, which is actually conveniently on this tourist map. So this is where we do our field work. It is an amazing place. This is an excavated Mayan city 
um, around which the forest has grown up because it's an archaeological reserve protected by the country of Belize. This is another view with a different temple. Um, and it's adjacent to the New River Lagoon, shown here, um, which is actually a freshwater river, but it widens out here for some reason into a, looks basically like a lake. And there's a savanna on the other side that we can also work on. I'm losing my headgear here. Oh. So the logistical support in this area, there's a, we're, the, the place that we work is adjacent to a small town called Indian Church. And I took this picture from a small plane a few years ago, and this is about half of Indian Church right here. It's home to about 200 people, and many of them work at a small eco-tourist lodge called Lamini Outpost Lodge, which is where we stay and is our base of operations in the field that's right on the lagoon and right next to the archaeological reserve. So this is really cushy field work. These are the little cabanas we get to stay in. They have beds, they have electricity, they have showers. They have hot running water most of the time. Because it's an ecotourist lodge, they have a central gathering place, um, which has Wi-Fi too, although it's kind of patchy. But they also serve three meals a day of excellent food. And for those of you who've done a lot of field work, you know that the amount of time you can spend in the field just feeding yourself and cooking and cleaning up can be enormous. And having this logistical support of just being fed constantly wonderful food means that we can get a lot more work done because we're not being bothered by all these day-to-day -day routines of, of staying alive. Um, this is what it looks like when everybody's eating. And in this picture, every single person in this picture is a bat biologist. So when we work there, we basically take over the whole place and have between 30 and 40 bat biologists and sometimes entomologists and botanists around the edges there for a period of time. And so there's a great deal of collaborative work, talk about science, mentoring of students, writing papers. All of that can take place here in addition to the field work. Part of what makes Lem and I special too is that the lodge has gone out of its way to build facilities that are useful for groups like ours. This is a room they built in a building in the back which we call the classroom, but we basically turn it into a field laboratory while we're there. And so we can do sorts of work and studies having this kind of support that we couldn't do if we were in a tent, for example. But the real draw for us, of course, is the forest and the habitats there. And luckily for us, the lodge is right adjacent to the archaeological reserve. You can walk from where we're staying right into the reserve. This is a map of the area. The, the lodge where we stay is down here at the bottom. All of these sort of squiggly colored lines here are various trails and roads that are maintained by the, the reserve staff um, so the tourists can get in and out and around and see the various parts of the, the uh, archaeological site. The gray boxes are the major buildings, the major temples, some of which you saw before. So because of the way the reserve's maintained, um, they've reconstructed a number of the buildings, so they're you know, spectacular and wonderful to climb up and sit on. Um, but they've also maintained open spaces like this plaza. Um, so this, this provides different kinds of habitats for bats and different kinds of places for us to work. There's good understory forest here. This is the ball court, the Mayan ball court. And you can see sort of the size of the trees here and the spaces. And we do a lot of catching bats in this area as well. In addition to Mayan ruins, there's also some colonial ruins in the area. This is an old sugar mill that's sort of adjacent to the Mayan city. And you can see the size of some of the trees that have grown up here, and we work around this area as well. When we look at the largest trees, basically the canopy is about 20, 25 meters high across the whole reserve with all this understory. And this is important because we know from numbers of studies of bat ecology that different bat species use different parts of the airspace in a neotropical forest. So there's some bats that only ever forage near the ground in tight spaces, others that prefer the mid canopy, others that forage under the canopy. There are some species that basically never go down in the forest at all. They may roost up high in trees, but then they do all their foraging up high, or they drop down into open spaces like that plaza. And then there's edge species. So if we want to learn about all the different species of bats in an area, we need to access to these different areas. And conveniently for us, the, the lodge staff maintains this series of, of trails to get around to see the archaeological site that we can use for studying bats. These are sort of like super highways for bats. So a bat may roost one place and want to go drink or forage somewhere else, and they zip along these trails because they're kept um, un, you know, uncluttered by the staff, goes around and cleans them every so often. So this is where we do a lot of our work. 
So here's Lamini Reserve on the, the um, New River Lagoon here. Um, we also work at another site about 10 kilometers away called Kakabish, and it's also an archaeological site. It's also a Mayan city, but it's unexcavated. So this is what it looks like out at Kakabish, and you can see these mounds here. Those aren't mounds, those are unexcavated Mayan temples and buildings. So because this site is not protected as part of a reserve, it's been looted over the years, many times over many decades. And so all of the buildings have these tunnels that have been dug into them by looters to get at artifacts. But these spaces provide roosting sites for bats as well. So that is one of the draws of this site for us. So how do we study bats in the field? Well, one of our main tools is well known to ornithologists are mist nets. So these are fine nylon nets with a mesh size of about two and a half centimeters. And we string them up like giant volleyball nets, basically, in the forest, although they go all the way down to the bottom of the ground. So you have end poles and a series of shelf cords in the middle that help support the net. And you put the net up, and it looks something like this when it's strung. And you can see how it sort of shimmers, mist-like in the mist, whatever. Anyway, um, this is the primary tool for catching bats. You put them up and they're hard to detect. They're hard to see or to sense with echolocation and so the bats get tangled in them and you can catch them. Most of our nets go on poles like this. Um, so they're about this high, about three meters high. This is um, one of our favorite net poles thanks to Angelo Soto Santino. These are golf ball retrievers which make the best net poles in the world. Um, and you can actually s sort of semi see some of the net is coming towards us here in this photograph. That's why it's all fuzzy here. These are really hard to see once you put them up. In addition to the ground level nets, we also have what we call a high net rig, which goes on these huge aluminum poles with ropes going up here. And the high net rig allows us to stack mist nets on top of each other. So we can put three mist nets up at once, one on top of another, and have them about 10, 10 or 12 meters in height. So that basically is covering more airspace. It looks sort of like this when you're looking up into one of those high nets. So we put them up and then we wait for it to get dark. We tend our nets, we continue as it gets dark, walking back and forth, and if we're lucky, we find something like this. This is a bat that has flown into the net and gotten tangled up. They can get tangled up really fast, and they can get really tangled if they do loop-to-loops, which they like to do, and it takes a lot of patience to get them out. So here's a picture of Melissa Ngala, one of the RGGS students, taking a bat out of a net. You basically have to unthread all of the twists for where it went in to get it out. But afterwards, it's great because once you get the bat out of the net, it's completely uninjured. These animals go in, get tangled up, we pull them out. So it's a kind of trapping in essence, but it doesn't injure the animals in any way. And it can be really effective. Every one of these bags has an individual bat in it taken out of a couple of mist nets. And we can put up multiple mist nets. The more people we have in the field, the more nets we can put up, the more bats we can get. In addition to mist nets, we also use what are called harp traps, which are these uh, arrangements made of aluminum tubing. And what you can't see here is there's a whole bank of monofilament threads pulled tight down across your two. There's, there's one on one side and about, I don't know, 10 centimeters back a second set. So it looks like this up close. So what happens is a bat flying down a trail like that is not going to detect these, or if it does, it folds its wings to go through the first panel, opens its wings again, and hits the second panel. And then it just falls plop, down into this bag at the bottom. And that's a canvas bag on the outside with plastic sheets inside, and the bat sort of scrambles up under the plastic and it can't get out. And so then it just stays there until you can go along and pick them up. And so here's a bat in the bottom here I'm taking out. There's more bats over here. Anyway, to me this feels like Christmas when you put one of these up. You put it up, you go away for a couple hours, you come back, and if you're lucky, it can be just absolutely full of bats, especially in the morning. We run these all night long. We check them two or three times during the night, and then we go to bed for a few hours and come back at five in the morning and find multiple bats. And interestingly, these sample a slightly different part of the fauna than mist nets do. We also use hand nets. Um, basically butterfly nets in small spaces. And here's one of my favorite pictures. <laughs> this, this is a colonial era cistern that goes down about 10 meters in the ground. And somebody came back one day and said, there's bats roosting in it. And so we went out, and this is Angelo Soto Santino here with Neil holding his ankle so he doesn't fall in, using a hand net down inside there. And he was in fact successful in catching these bats. There were two of them in there of 
this species, Maimon cosmelli, which is about we don't catch very often any other way. So this was a great capture to pull it out with a hand net. So if you wonder where some of these wonderful pictures come from, these are the work of my colleague and the major collaborator on this project, Brock Fenton. Um, Brock is a retired bat ecologist from the University of Western Ontario in Canada. And what retired for Brock means is that he has more time to go in the field than he did before, traveling all over the world catching bats. And he's become in the last decade or so one of the premier bat photographers in the world too. So he travels around with this enormous set of, of photographic equipment. And in addition to taking pictures of bat, uh, bats in the hand, we, he also uses photographic methods to learn a lot about ro bat roosting behavior. Um, for example, this is a hollow tree out by the sugar mill that we know bats live inside, um, but we don't necessarily know what species or whether those species are changing over time. And every year we go back and we photograph the emergences of these animals so we can see what species are there. Um, so this is Brock and his wife Sherry setting up their equipment they have six flash units, then they have this, this infrared beam set with I think it's four or five infrared beams. And basically the bats take their own pictures coming out when they break the beams. This is a picture I took from the outside, and that's about as good pictures I've ever gotten from this kind of thing. Um, but I'm not timed to the timing here. When you take pictures with the actual equipment, this is one of Brock's pictures. And some of our collaborators who have been working in Belize are actually functional morphologists interested in the evolution of flight and wing form. And they've been using these photographs to study the, the flexible parts of the bat wing. You know, we can look in museum specimens, we can see how long are the bones, what's the, 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 you know, what are the muscles like, but how much do the wings bend? How much camber do they have? What kind of, how do they make these weird churning motions? With the thousands and thousands of pictures we're getting, we can study these sorts of things, and that's part of what they're doing. We can also use these photographic methods for basically survey um, of, of what's around. This is one of the looters tunnels at Kakabish, and in 2016, at about midnight, Brock came rushing into the lab, said, look at this, and showed me this picture. And my jaw dropped open because I was pretty sure, looking at this picture, that this was a family of bats we had never caught before in this area. Um, but of course, it's just a picture, so we went out and went back to the place where he'd seen it coming out of that hole, but the bats were gone, and we never saw them again that year. But the following year, we went back with a couple of other collaborators. This is Winifred Frick and her husband, Paul Heady, who work on um, bats in Mexico, cave bats, and they're really good with hand nets because they have to net a lot of their, their study animals themselves. So they went into this hole, we put mist nets over the top, we tried to make sure the bats didn't come out, we were hoping they were there, and in fact they were, and we were able to catch some specimens. So this is a Natalis Mexican, and these are the first records from this area. So the photography led us to learn that there was a species we didn't even know was there. So this again brings me back to the collaborative nature of what we do and the number of people involved. This is a picture from 2011, and this is a picture from last year. So some of the faces change every year. We have new students, we have new collaborators, new postdocs, people come and go. But there's a core of about, I would say, 10 sort of senior researchers who we go back every year and we bring our, our students and our postdocs, and then we have um, bat biologist friends from other parts of the world who drop in for a year or two, maybe an expert on bats of Malaysia, bats of Africa, who will come to learn about the fauna and work with us. Um, the two most important key people in this project are really right here. Um, Brock, who I've already talked about, and Neil Duncan, who many of you know, collections manager in mammalogy. Neil's been going down since, I think, 2012? Um, working with me in Belize, and he's become the, basically the leader of many of the, the, the field components of what we do, taking groups of people out, organizing them, making sure the high nets get up, all of this sort of stuff. And um, without Neil, a, a lot of the, the, the success we've had in catching the large numbers of bats that we need for some of these projects, we just wouldn't have managed to do. So managing this whole crew of, of people is, is quite a logistical challenge, and we sort of fall back on an old-fashioned method of a blackboard. So every morning, those of us who are involved in sort of organizing things get together and decide what we want to do that night. Where do we want to go? We want to go netting at Kakabish. We want to put the high net up someplace. We want to put the harp trap up someplace. So we figure out what we're going to do, and we put up sign-up sheets on the blackboard, and then 
our students, our postdocs, our visiting researchers, and so on, people can decide where they want to go. So it's kind of free form where, you know, where everyone ends up. But if somebody needs help with a project or they particularly need a taxon that they know can be gotten in a certain place, we can make it happen. And so then every night we come back with loads of bats from multiple sites across our research area. When I first started working down there, I was one of the invited people into a group that's sort of free form, and, and I went down just by myself, and I collected some animals. And it was, it was a few years before we realized that we were missing some opportunities to really collect good data on every single capture that we made at every single site. So back in 2014, we got more serious about making this a concerted research effort. We came up with the big, exciting novelty of labeling every bag with a sticker that has basic information on it and standardized data sheets. So now, every field crew that goes anywhere and does everything takes one of these field sheets with them, and we get all the information back on what time, cat, what was captured, basic reproductive information. This was one thing from a harp trap and the rest from a ground net. Um, anyway, so we gather all this data so we don't lose information on any, um, any parts of what comes. Sometimes, you know, what was happening in the past is animals that were released we just never had any record of. In this case, we now have records of everything. Also a novelty we <laughs> introduced in 2014 was my colleague Beth Clare and I got together and put together a formal field key for the area that we could hand to all of our field crews, all of our new students, everybody, to teach them about the animals and how to tell them apart in the hand. And so this has been hugely valuable in getting correct identifications on things fast, which makes it easier to manage them as they come and go. And so in many cases, there are species that are super easy to identify. Anybody can do it. Other things, really, an expert has to look at. And so we want to make sure that er everything that experts need to look at comes back and an expert actually looks at it, um, and things like that. What I did was I made about a dozen of these and laminated them in heavy plastic and added a ruler for <laughs> measuring forearms. And so every field crew takes one of these out. And then the data that come back are much cleaner. Every, all the animals, almost all the animals, come back to the field lab for processing. And of course, the main component of that is making sure the IDs are correct. So here I was working, I think that was 2011 or something, with Judith Eager, who is a curator of mammals at the Royal Ontario Museum. And there are some real taxonomic problems with some of the species that we collect there. And so we spent a lot of time sorting out just what do these things look like? How can you really tell them apart at this site? This is also where the, f the fancy bat face photography gets done. Here's Brock holding a bat here with the black background while various people take pictures of it. And that's where like this picture came from. Specimens. Definitely collect a lot of specimens. Um, put up big series of all the species early in the early years I was working there. Doing less of that now. But every animal that we sacrifice comes back here. Sometimes parts get dissected in the field. People are doing myology, reproductive tract morphology, things like that. They can do it on fresh animals, and then the rest of it comes back here eventually. Collect a lot of data on every specimen, of course. All the measurements and stuff, everything goes in the field catalog. Today, though, we're doing more non-invasive sampling. Um, wing punching, for example, um, using a small biopsy punch. You can take a plug out of a bat wing and um, bring it back for DNA studies. And I have just learned a couple weeks ago that putting these little wing punches into vials of desiccant provides the highest weight molecular weight DNA that my, my collaborators have gotten out of any kind of sample. We also want to make sure that all the animals we release survive and do well. We release probably 90% of the animals we catch now. Um, so we feed and water them before we let them go. This is a little fruit feeding bat, so it's getting some juice and a syringe. Make sure it has enough energy so that it'll survive. And we recapture a lot of animals so that we know that they're, they're doing well. This is an example of a bat, uh, flying bat, and here's where the wing punch was taken. Um, so I like this picture because you can see where it was actually sampled. So what have we learned about um, the fauna over the years here? Well, as in all neotropical bat fauna, they're quite ecologically diverse. There are insectivorous bats that feed on the wing on a whole variety of different types of food. There are frugivorous bats, nectar-feeding bats that feed on nectar and pollen from flowers. There are carnivorous bats that eat small vertebrates, fishing bats, and even true vampire bats. 
So all together at our field sites, we've now got representatives of seven bat families. There's one family that we haven't caught at, at this area, the disc wing bats of the Thyropteridae. They may simply just not be there. Um, that's a group which is highly sensitive to there being a really pronounced dry season. And we know there's a really pronounced dry season in this part of Belize. So it's possible they're just really not there. In terms of site-specific bat species diversity, over the years I've been working there, we've now um, come up with a total of 41 species at the Lemonai Preserve and 23 species at Kakabish, which is the unexcavated Mayan city. So why are these numbers different? Well, some of it is sampling effort. We spent more time sampling at Lamini than we have at Kakabish, but there's a lot more than that going on as well. First off, there are some big ecological differences um, between the two sites. So the Lamini Preserve is right on the New River here. So there's ready access to a lot of water, and that definitely plays a role for some taxa. For instance, this is a giant fishing bat. These guys use their echolocation to detect ripples on the surface of the water where there are small fish, and they use these great big hind feet as gaps to catch the fish. We only ever get these over bodies of water. These little guys are proboscis bats, and if you've ever traveled on water courses anywhere in the Neotropics, you've probably seen these. They roost on the outsides of trees, on trunks or overhanging branches, usually in little rows, little lines. And there, we really only ever see these guys associated with water. So we know right off that the presence absence of water at these two sites is definitely playing a role in faunal composition. But there's something more to the whole story. This map I showed earlier, you might have noticed that the green represents forest. The brown represents agricultural fields. Unfortunately, this part of Belize is under real agricultural pressure and increasing deforestation. And our Kakabish site here is right in the middle of this zone of agricultural development. So this is a picture I took from a small plane, again, a few years ago. Um, and this is what we see when we go down there. In the dry season in particular, the local farmers clear their land, new land, cut the forest down, let the trees dry out, burn it off, and then it looks like this. So this is actually the road out to the Kakabish site. Um, looks like this every year. There's more and more burning going on. So what you end up with is this patchwork of forest fragments. So, you know, here's your field and here's your nice forest and it's encroaching. And this is actually an aerial picture of the Kakabish site. And, the, and you can tell here how small this fragment is. The size of the forest is big here because there's this unexcavated Mayan city with buildings underneath, so it hasn't been deemed appropriate for agricultural use. And there's efforts to try and protect it, but it is just a fragment. So we wanted to do some community structure analyses of what's going on in these two sites, the bigger forest preserve and adjacent forest, and then Kakabish. So we have good bat capture data from both sites, so species and relative abundance, for four field seasons, um, 2014 to 2017. We know the ecological traits of the bat species from our work and from other people's work in the area. So we know the diet, foraging habitats, types of roosts used, and so on for each species. And we know phylogenetic relationships from ongoing studies by a whole variety of people. And I want to point out here one of the key movers in getting these data analyzed is known to many of you, James Herrera. Um, James was a postdoc here for two years. He's at Duke now. Um, he came to the Department of Mammalogy to study primate evolution. He's co-advised by myself and John Flynn. And he's a primate specialist. But I thought, you know, I said, wouldn't you like to become a mammologist, not just a primate person? <laughs> and offered him a chance to go in the field. He's a, he's a great field guy. He's done a lot of field work in Madagascar with lemurs. And a lot of his interests are in community ecology and the evolution of communities. And so he looked at our capture data and said, oh, I want to work on that. Came back to Lamini twice, and so he's been integral in getting these data analyzed. So what did we find? Um, well, over that, just that four-year time frame, we caught um, almost 1,500 bat, 32 species. The fragment fauna is, turns out to be a nested subset of the Lamini preserve fauna. The functional richness is higher in the preserve. So that means that there's more e different ecological niches represented. So different foraging habits, different roosting habits, and so on in the preserve than in the fragment. 
species in the preserve are more closely related phylogenetically than expected by chance. Closely related species and species with different diets co-occurred at both sites more often than did distant relatives in those with same dietary habits. Species with flexible roost habits, so those are species that we would find in, say, three different roost types or more instead of just one kind of roost, were higher relative abundance in the fragment than in the preserve. Closely related roost specialist species had higher relative abundance in the lamini preserve. So what can you conclude from that set of patterns? Where overall it looks like competition for resources, especially food and roost, is the driving, is the driving mechanism of community assembly in our study area. While local extirpation and decreased dispersal are the most likely mechanisms of community disassembly in this system. And that's what we think we're seeing with the fragment as a, as a community in the process of being disassembled by habitat fragmentation. But the really interesting finding is that flexibility and roost use may aid species in colonization or in persistence in the fragment. So it turns out that roosting may be one of the real key ecological traits that we didn't really appreciate its importance in habitat fragmentation um, in the past. And this fits in with some work that I did with Rob Voss and Paul Velasco analyzing Amazonian roost communities and roost guilds. This is a whole different site where we're seeing similar importance of roosts. So I've already talked about three kinds of roosts. So we have tree holes like this, we have bat species that roost on the outsides of branches, and then we have these looters tunnels, but there's lots of other different kinds of roost types that bats use as well in the neotropics. Natural caves are one, but animal burrows turn out to be really important as well. So this is an armadillo burrow, and these are sort of small-scale caves, and here's a bat inside an armadillo burrow. So some species routinely use this sort of site. Cavities inside fallen trees are important. So when a really big tree comes down and root rots out from the inside, as, there, as is common, bats can use that space inside. Other species roost in unmodified foliage. So you can see the bats here on the underside of a palm frond. This little white speck up here is a bat as well. It's a ghost bat. But it's not just unmodified foliage that bats use in the tropics. Some bats actually modify the foliage intentionally to make tents. So this is a palm frond, and the bats have chewed along, the ed uh, along part of the palm frond so that it sags down in a particular way to basically make an umbrella-like tent. And if you climb underneath and look up, you see this. And different species of bats use different species of palms and make different shaped tents. And this is highly stereotypical. Other bats roost in dry foliage or under bark. And still others even roost in an arboreal termite nest. So these are sort of rock hard structures that termites often make up in trees in the tropics. And there are bat species that chew holes in them and then roost inside those holes. And this is a picture that Rob got somewhere from the Amazon. This is a picture we took at Lamini of a, a, exactly the same kind of roost. So it turns out that species that routinely use more than one roost type are much more common and abundant in habitat fragments than they are in the larger forest fragments. So this study, this community structure analysis, we've completed it and written it up and it's now in review at a journal, so we've, we've gotten that far with it. It's not published quite yet. But that was the work of Many people helping to catch the bats, but the analysis in the paper was a small set of people. But many of the people in this group had their own individual projects, either by themselves or in collaboration with one or two people. And I want to showcase several more of those projects to show you the kind of work we're doing as a group. And I want to focus on three students who are known to many of you. So Kelly Spear on the left is a third year RGGS student. In the middle is and Melissa Ingala, a second year RGGS student. And on the right is Lexi Brown, who's a first year master's student at Columbia. And they're all working um, at Lamini. And I should point out here that they're all co-advised by me and Susan Perkins. And Susan is the key um, to basically helping with the mentoring at the lab side of things and, and is, is involved in all these projects too. So first I want to talk about Melissa's work. If you were at her second year RGGS symposium, you've already heard some of this. 
Um, Melissa works on the gut microbiome of bats, so the community of bacteria living in the gut. And she's interested in the roles that host bat phylogeny and diet may play in structuring the microbiome. But not just that, also the role that the microbiome may play in allowing bats to utilize certain kinds of diets and in turn affecting the evolution of diversity in bats. So when she first came to me with ideas about wanting to study bat microbiomes and going in the field and stuff, I started asking questions because I've never done any of this before. Like, how do you do this? How do you start with the bat and get to what kind of science you want to do? Well, it turns out that um, many people who study microbiomes of wild animals sacrifice the animal, take out the intestine, scrape out the inside into a tube and sequence that and call that the microbiome. But you may not always be able to or want to kill the animal. And so another way to study the microbiome is to collect fecal samples and sequence that and call that the microbiome. So an obvious question that we started out asking is, do you, is this the same thing? Are you sampling the same thing when you use these different methods? So Melissa developed a really simple, elegant little project to test this. So in the field, taking an animal, collecting a fecal sample, sacrificing it, collecting the colon sample from the same individual, sequencing those, and comparing them to see if you get the same results. So luckily at Lamini, we get a lot of bats, a lot of taxonomic and dietary diversity. So she was able to sample broadly across a whole bunch of different families of bats, all sorts of different dietary habits, and you catch a bat, if it provided a fecal sample, then it could potentially be uh, a member of this study. Anyway, so what were the results? Well, first off, here's one of the results. Um, Artibius lateratus, a frugivore, when you compare the um, components, the, the, uh, what the microbiome looks like from the colon sample with what it looks like from the fecal sample, very similar. You have the same phyla of bacteria, similar um, abundance levels, so this looks like you're getting the same signal from these two kinds of samples. But it doesn't always turn out that way. Here's another example, one of the little insectivorous bats that we catch. Very different signal on what the microbiome is from these two different samples. So why might this be? Well, um, the hypothesis that, um, that we're putting forward, and I think Melissa's right on this, is that these two different methods are probably sampling different parts of the microbiome. So if this is a cross-section of the intestine of, a, of an animal, and there are some bacteria that are closely associated with the wall of the gut. There are other bacteria that are basically loose in the lumen of the gut, and these may be different communities, and they're preserving different signals. So if we look at just what the microbiome looks like from the wall of the intestine collected from a dead animal and compare the microbiome to the host bat phylogeny, there's a very close fit that suggests that it is the um, host bat phylogeny that is probably one of the main drivers of microbiome composition. You get a very different picture from looking at the fecal samples. Here, what we suspect is going on is that diet is providing a stronger signal. This is just the first step of more studies of this whole system. And I have to give uh, Melissa a, a great credit here because these data were only collected last May, and she's already gotten this paper written and through the first half of the review process, and now it's going back to the journal. So this is already basically done. Moving ahead, this coming season, we're gonna, she's going to be looking at um, fruit bats in particular and interested in whether the microbiome is playing a role in the um, nutrient availability to fruit bats because fruit does not have a lot of fatty acids or proteins or nitrogen. And so the microbiome may be key to allowing the evolution of um, fruit giver bats. And that's part of what she'll be studying. Also looking at the other things that in, in habit bats, um, these are um, worms that live in the intestinal tract and how um, helminth parasitism and the microbiome interact. So her thesis on molecular insights into the structure and function of neotropical bat microbiomes has several parts, and all of them depend on field samples that we're collecting in these trips. Another student is Kelly Spear, um, a third year RGGS student. And Kelly is also interested in bats and microbiomes, but with a different twist. So here we have the bat, the microbiome. Well, bats also have obligate ectoparasites called bat flies. There's two families of bat flies. They're blood feeding, and they cannot exist without bats. So they spend most of their life 
on their bat hosts. So the bat has the bat flies, and the bat flies have their own microbiomes. And Kelly is interested in the structure of those microbiomes and how the bat's microbiome may affect the ability of the bat or of the fly to transmit pathogens between bats. And this is really key because of the way uh, the ecology of the hosts and the flies. So I told you about this tree that has like four different species or five different species of bats that live in it. Well, bat flies, the females have to leave the bat to deposit their larvae and eggs on the inside of the the roost during part of the life cycle, and then the female fly has to get back on a bat. Meanwhile, those larvae develop, and then once they become adults, they have to find a bat. So there's a lot of potential for switching bats within a species, but also between species, because these parasites are in the roost. So there can be a lot of back and forth thing between um, individual bats and between different species of bats. Well, how do you study this in the field? Well, you have to get a lot of bats, and then you have to pick a lot of flies off the bats. So here is a vampire bat with its wing extended, and every one of those little dots is a bat fly. Um, most bats don't have this many. This is a, a good example of a heavily parasitized bat. And basically, using special forceps, you have to pluck the flies off the bat. And, and Kelly has developed a zen with the forceps for going, you know, getting, getting those flies. And, uh, these still pictures do not explain how hard it is to do this because these things are constantly moving and they're diving into the nooks and crannies of the wing membrane and running through the fur. So basically a lot of help to catch the bats, to help hold the bats, and then a lot of work to get those flies. Also Kelly takes blood samples from all the bats from which we, she collects the flies so she can compare the parasite, the bacterial parasites in the blood of the bats to what's in the flies. So her thesis on the impact of phylogenetics and ecology on variation of the microbiome in these flies has a bunch of different parts, like uh, Melissa's. Two of these on temporal variation, um, it, we're doing at lamini, so she's studying variation in the microbiome of flies from the same bats from year to year, and then the functional profile data will come from there as well. But what about geographic variation? Well, obviously we don't have enough geographic variation in this site. So conveniently, one of the people I talked about earlier, Winifred Frick, who got to know Kelly in the field, has a field site up in Mexico with a cave full of bats that she works on and contacts across the range of that species of bats. So for this part of her thesis, Kelly is using these contacts, and it's only because Fred got to know Kelly in the field and see how hard she works that this collaboration is possible. So this is an important part of her thesis. Same thing with the habitat fragmentation. Obviously, we have a lot of habitat fragmentation in this part of Belize, but in a four-year PhD program, there's not time to go out and sample 20 fragments separately and get all of these data. And also, we don't have the local connections to find the right size fragments and so on. However, yet another one of our colleagues has stepped in here. So this is Beth Clare that I co-authored that key I showed you earlier for the site. Beth is on the faculty at Queen Mary University in London and um, she has a graduate student from Brazil who's been working in Brazil in the Atlantic Forest for a couple of years, surveying different forest fragments of different sizes, catching all the bats. He's studying food webs and habitat fragmentation, but he collected flies from all his bats. So those flies have then come to Kelly, and she's working up the microbiome from known bat species, known fragment sizes, and so on as another part of her work. One more thing about the flies, because these are really cool. So two families of flies, but they don't all look like flies, and some of them are indeed flightless. This is a single bat fly. These flies are nycterobias. They're so big that each fly basically needs a bat of its own. Now, we don't actually see these in Belize. This is an African species, but I love this picture, so I had to put it up here. But my other student, <laughs> Lexi Brown, is interested in studying the bat flies. And for her master's thesis, she's going to be working on a project looking at the ecology of bat hosts and how that correlates with the population genetics of bat flies. And she's going to be working with some of the samples from Belize, but she's also working on the Brazilian samples with Kelly doing the bat fly identifications and looking at the correlations there. So all three of these ladies, their projects would simply just not exist as they are today without this big collaborative field effort. So we get back to this this big group thing. Over the years, I've, been, I've gotten involved because of the roles that I've played in the field here and doing all the identifications and all of that and all the sampling and all the permits in a number of projects, some of which are pretty cool. And one that was recently published is one looking at heavy metals in the uh, bats of this region. 
So this is collaborative with um, Dan Becker here and Hugh Broders um, in the faculty and um, up in Canada. And as you all know, mercury can be an environmental pollutant. Um, it can be emitted from smokestacks of factories. It can also come from mines. And what worries us is that it bioaccumulates in food webs. And um, particularly, this is an increasing concentration as you move up the food chain is well known in systems like this. So this is why you don't eat fish from the Hudson River, because they have bioaccumulated too much heavy metals, and you don't want to bioaccumulate those metals yourself. Anyway, we can study these um, non-invasively with hair samples. And so for the last several years, we've been collecting hair samples from the bats um, at Lam and I. And here are some of the results. So these are our, our species over here on the left. And this is color coded now um, so that the, the colors tell you about the dietary habits of the bats. And I want to draw your attention to this scale down at the bottom as a log scale of mercury concentrations. So down here in the low mercury concentrations, we have our frugivorous bats and some omnivores. As you move up the log scale, it's the insectivores mostly up here that have quite high concentrations. And then we have some outliers here at the top. Well, who are these outliers? Well, the very top one is this big fishing bat. So this is basically a top carnivore in an aquatic ecosystem. The second one down, it's a little proboscis bat. Remember I told you it also forages over water. And so this got us thinking about connectivity to aquatic food webs. So we looked worldwide for data on bats and mercury concentrations and found bats um, from a variety of different places where this had been studied and there were data in the literature, looked at phylogenetic components and so on. But the thing that came out overall is by far the highest factor was the percent of a potentially aquatic prey in the diet seems to be a huge factor that is influencing um, mercury concentrations in bats. And so actually this was just published in February, I guess, that mercury bioaccumulation in bats reflects dietary connectivity to aquatic food webs. So this is telling us we need to look out for this, particularly in places where we have um, a strong component of the fauna which is associated with water and feeds over water or on aquatic organisms. Other research we've been doing, there's been a lot of work on the vampires in, at Lamini. Um, one of our colleagues has been banding bats now for about five years um, you know, with these wristbands to track you know, mark recapture studies and also to track um, changes in their health and immune profiles and so on. And one of the first papers from this we just published actually last week um, which it looks at immune profiles and bacterial infection risks basically as a function of livestock abundance. And this is a combined data set using lamini at one, one end with, with high livestock abundance and then another study site in Peru, um, which is more remote. And so the whole livestock connection is important here, particularly for um, disease ecology. This is a, a picture we took um, locally. Most of the bats that we work with, the vampire bats, probably fly out of the forest and feed on local livestock. And actually one of my previous students, Amy Ray, who may be known to some of you, Amy got her master's up at Columbia, um, and she worked on mostly on samples from Guatemala, but also took blood samples of the local cattle at, 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 in Belize here at Lamini. Um, but it was interesting because this was a case uh, where um, the work in Belize provided great training opportunities because Amy had done tons of lab work but had never gotten you know, her hands dirty basically catching bats, learning how to put up mist nets, how to take blood samples from live bats and all of that. So she came out and got all of that experience with us in, uh, in Belize. A lot of other people have gotten um, field experience who are known to many of you who are staff from the museum. So Ellie Hager's been to Belize with me once, is going back again this year. Um, Eileen Westwig, Asia Marcato, um, neither of them are here anymore. Asia, went, um, after leaving the museum a few years ago, has worked for the last couple of years at a bat conservation organization and is now looking at PhD programs in bat conservation biology. Um, Brian O'Toole uh, just left us very recently. He's in a master's program at Fordham um, looking at conservation genetics of bats for her master's thesis. Postdocs, also a lot of involvement. I've already talked about James. Uh, many of you know Abby Curtis came here. She's one of the uh, world's experts on the evolution of cranial morphology in mammals, um, particularly using CT scanning technology. And she came here and did a two-year postdoc working with me on bats. 
and, and cranial evolution, but she'd never handled live bats before. Um, so we were able to take her down, and, and some of the insights I think that she gained from you know, working with the live animals, I think has really helped inform her research on these bats. But she got a lot of training here in the field too. Other postdocs, past and present, um, uh, Andrea Cernello, Paul Velasco, um, Angelo, um, these guys all came to Belize with a ton of field work already, already bat field experts. And so their role down here was just to help catch a lot of animals, but also to help train the students. And uh, not just students from here, but students and postdocs from other places. So big contributions to all of these guys. But the teaching and training we do is not just limited to our own little group. We also do a lot of outreach. Um, every year we send groups into the local schools to talk about bats, because this is their country and their fauna. And they get really, really excited to get to see the live animals. Here's Melissa showing a boy a live vampire bat. So, you know, his family probably owns cattle, most of the people in the village do. And getting to actually see these animals can be a really big deal for them. So we make sure we do this every year. Finally, I want to conclude by showing you sort of the biggest piece of outreach we have done. Uh, Science Bulletins sent Jason Morefoot down to Belize with us in 2016, and we made a video which has been showing in the Hall of Biodiversity, basically focused in part on this field work in Belize. And so now I just want to conclude, if I can make this work, by showing you our video. You smell the ammonia as soon as you come in. See him? Neat, eh? Yeah. Those are vampire bats. These are vampire bats, yeah. There are 1,300 living species of bats. That is about 20 to 22 percent of all living mammals. It's this one here. Oh, there's a bat. We think that the great diversity of bats has to do with the fact that they occupy a really unusual niche for a mammal. That is a nocturnal flying mammal niche. Beautiful. So you have some roosting high up in trees, others close to the ground. Bugger. And different bats eating different kinds of things nectar feeders, fruit feeders, carnivores, insectivores, and even blood feeding bats, the vampires. I'm an evolutionary biologist interested in the evolution of diversity in body form of mammals, diets of mammals, species diversity of mammals. And bats are just a wonderful group to work on because they're so diverse, so interesting, they do so many different things. typical night of catching bats begins at about 5 o'clock. We need to give ourselves an hour, hour and a half, to get everything situated before the bats wake up. Oh, we got a fourth. Oh, and it got out. Spoke too soon. Bats can be told apart with a variety of different traits. The size and shape of the nose leaf varies from one species to another. What was there? Uh, the vampire bat. There are bats that have stripes above and below their eyes. Shape of the ears can vary. This is a little nectar feeding bat. It has a long tongue that it can put inside flowers. So just looking at the outside of the bat, you can tell a great deal about what species it might be. There Take you it go. Out. No. It's not as rotund as. Can you help? No. Okay. Oh, that's that standard vampire sound. There are three species of vampire bats the hairy leg, the white winged, and the common vampire bat. In this portion of Belize, we only find the common vampire bat. Well, on to my naked hand. The three species all feed on blood, but the hairy-legged bat only feeds on bird blood. The white-winged bat feeds on bird blood, and there have been records of them feeding on mammalian blood. But the common vampire bat specializes on feeding on mammals. 
not want to be tangled up in make it. Or a garden. Now you are. Be photogenic. Yeah. Nice mug. We don't entirely understand why there are three vampire bat species. What kind of diversification has happened there? And so using molecular biology, sequencing DNA, we can really get at this question. A long-standing goal in molecular evolution is to understand which are the changes in individual genes that have made each species unique. So my research group has undertaken a large-scale screen of genes that are candidates for having undergone positive selection. One of the genes that we came across was the gene for plasminogen activator in vampire bats. All organisms have what's called plasminogen activator, which is active in their tissues and plays an important role in maintaining blood flow throughout the body. In vampire bats, Adaptive changes have enabled them to express the activator in their saliva. So when they bite an animal, it helps to keep blood flowing, allowing the vampire to keep feeding. So here we are at the vampire bat, and we've separated out the bat and activator. When we look at changes in individual genes, we're ultimately asking how does it affect the fitness of the organism? The probability of surviving, of finding a mate, and of reproducing. And so this is the biological currency in which evolution works. When we think about things like blood feeding, if you're able to get a new food source and to reproduce faster, then that's increasing your fitness and makes you more likely to survive, more likely to reproduce. So plasminogen activator is a crucial promoter of breaking up blood clots within vampire bats. When we started this work, the idea that there were changes to this gene in vampire bats was already known to science. However, it was not known how this related to the blood feeding behavior of different vampire bat species. When we compared the genes of the three species, we found that they were different. While the hairy leg vampire, which feeds on bird blood, had a normal activator, a modification to the gene in the white-winged and common vampire bat appeared to be related to the ability to feed on the blood of mammals. Mammals have a mechanism that enables them to shut off the activator when bleeding becomes dangerous, allowing blood to clot. The change that we found in the white-winged and common vampire bat enables them to override this clotting mechanism and keep blood flowing in mammals they bite. Once we've sequenced a gene, we can build a gene tree reflecting the evolution of that gene. We can then take that gene tree and correlate it with the species tree, adding discoveries of genetic changes within that species. So I think this is actually an elegans. See how the knees are naked? Everything that we observe in how a species interacts with its environment will have some basis at some level in genetics. And so understanding the genetic processes that give rise to how species are different and how they interact differently with the environment is a fundamental scientific question that enables us to understand species in general. The age of genomics has just opened up so many new areas for research. We're able to answer questions that in the past biologists would have liked to know the answers to, but there were no tools. So basically, it's a whole new toolkit that lets us address all kinds of interesting biological questions that we just couldn't get at before. OK, that's it. I just want to thank everybody who's been in the field with me or will go in the future. This is a really productive research program, and it's been a real pleasure to tell you about it today. Thank you. Nancy, how does the uh, diversity or species uh, richness in Belize compare with other high diversity sites in the Neotropics? So the, if there's a shortcoming of this site, 
in this area is that it doesn't have nearly the species diversity that we would have if it we were It seemed a little low to me. Yeah, yeah. well, but this, this is standard for, this for Central America, basically. Um, so as we get closer to the equator, species richness goes way up. And so like the sites that I've worked in, French Guiana, for instance, and our Peruvian projects, they have much higher species diversity there. The advantages of this site are largely that it is just so logistically easy. Um, permits wise, um, the backbone of the, the lodge and the people we work with, yeah, I'd love that, I would, I, it'd be great if this was plopped down in the middle of the Amazon, um, but the advantages of working here just with what we can get done, you know, make it a, a great place too. But yeah, it's not as high diversity, no question. Um, Perhaps relating to that is that presumably all the forest around the Mayan sites is all secondary. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that that is for sure because when the Maya were there, it was it was all gone. Clear so it's just really big secondary forest. So do you have any idea of what the uh, original species distributions were like in the forests and how that might af affect the distribution of right. current species? Right. The short answer to that is no. We have no idea. Um, that whole part of the Yucatan was very heavily um, habited by the Maya, and they're only now with all of the, the LIDAR and stuff coming to realize how dense the populations were. So a huge amount of deforestation goes way back to that time. And so presumably, you know, our, our current fauna must have been affected, um, but that was too long ago, and so no, I can't answer that question. I'd love to, but I can't. Any other questions? I have a methodological question. So we saw that the mist nets and the multiple mist nets that you set up and maybe even the harp traps uh, seem to be set up on a daily basis, if I understood right. correctly. Mm -hmm. Do you move them around to different locations to yes. get different things? And if you leave it up in a singular location, maybe for several nights in a row, do the bats learn to avoid it? Yes, yeah, so this is something that's well known and, and uh, I learned about this back when I first started netting bats years ago in, in South America. If you put up nets more than one night in the same place, your capture rate goes wah, way down. Bats clearly learn and they avoid the nets if you put them up more than one night. Same thing with the harp traps. They you know, will do better at first in an area, but we, keep, we, know, we sort of know how far we need to move them um, to sample a different place. There's, in, in all of the analyses of these data, sampling um, effort and all these things have to be taken into account because we also we haven't worked as much at Kakabish as we have at Lamini, and there's like how many net nights and how many kinds of nets. We catch different species in the top of the high net that we never catch down at ground level. The harp traps catch different species than the mist nets do, and so there's all these other components to it too. Nancy, the um, uh, temporal sampling that you, you were talking about in terms of the uh, fragmented habitat. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have enough data, both from remote sensing and from your sampling, to be able to tell whether there have been changes in the species composition over time, and testing that against the the uh, patchiness of the habitat in that area? What we have found is that it's been remarkably consistent from year to year. When we look at when we look through time, we don't see any changes, but it's a course of small snapshot of time. We really only have good data for four years. Um, when we first started going to Kaka Beach, for instance, it was about 10 years ago, um, we weren't keeping track of abundance and so on. I know presence absence data from back then. Uh, we don't see any big differences. Um, one difference we've noticed recently is a decline actually in the vampire population and we don't know if that's due to eradication measures being taken locally or not. But, but anecdotally at least, from, from the data that we have make it look like it's pretty consistent through time at both sites. So are you able to make some ass assessments or predictions about uh, when you might reach threshold levels based on dispersal capability and nearby source yeah, areas? Yeah, that's a problem because we've also had so much ongoing deforestation in the area. When we first started working there, it was really connected eff effectively. There's, there was forest between Kakabish and Lamini that was intact, and it's only been in like the last probably four years that that has been completely broken. So we don't have enough data over time. If we keep going back there over time, we'll have more. 
um, but we can't track that very well just because of this ongoing process of cutting the forest down. And the last sort of sampling thing, you, you talked about not taking it as much um, uh, voucher right. specimens anymore. What, what controls your determination about, about your, uh, your vouchering? Um, numbers and taxonomic scope. Right. Well, when I first started working there, you know, I, what I really wanted was to have like a series of at least 20 individuals from the site, right? I, I, you know, I thought, well, okay, we'll start there. And if you're 20 individuals times 40 species, you know, there, that's a lot of animals. Um, and then I've also done a lot of playing cleanup to other projects. So if somebody else is there and they want to take a whole bunch of fruit bats to look at embryos, for instance, Karen Sears, then any time an animal sacrificed, I'm going to bring that back. But as time has passed, the research needs, like I've already got, you know, jars of these things here. We don't really need any more necessarily. But we are collecting lots of wing punches and blood samples and DNA samples. It's just not we're killing the bats. The last piece of this is that we're getting pushed back this year for the first time from the people who issue the permits. And they seem to be much less willing to have us doing lots of lethal sampling. So we may be headed in the direction of not being allowed to do lethal sampling in the future. We haven't quite gotten there yet. Um, you know, I'd always rather have more than less. But also, these are really long-lived animals. I actually, last week I was out at Cold Spring Harbor for a uh, sort of a think tank meeting about using bats as a model for aging. Because vampire bats can live 30 years. An individual vampire can live 30 years. And so I also start to worry about what happens when we go out and we collect and we collect and we collect and we collect for these long-lived animals that don't have, you know, have only one offspring a year. And so we basically don't want to poison the pond we're studying, in essence. So I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with backing off on the lethal sampling and doing more non-lethal sampling for this site. Hi. I have one question. I don't know who. Uh, that was awesome. <laughs> uh, has anybody looked, or could, would this be an opportunity with this amazing data set you have to look at the ecosystem services and or the services that the bats are providing for the region? Because, you know, you know their dispersal, you know you have insectivores, you know you have um, po right. pollinators. It could be a neat thing to look into. Yeah, so, so Beth Clare, my colleague from Queen Mary University, that's kind of the stuff that she's really interested in. Um, and so she's had ongoing projects in a number of places looking at food webs and ecosystem services and so on and so forth. And she's one of the co-authors on that paper. So I think that's the next step is, is getting more depth in that direction in the, the whole food webs and services thing. So yeah, I mean, one of the advantages of a place like this is we know these bats really well. For the most part, we're s there's multiple different kinds of studies on each one of these species. And so we know a lot about them. And so we are starting to get into a position to be able to do things like that. And it can feed into policy eventually, yeah. to potentially with all the fragmentation. Yeah, well, we're also working with, which I didn't have time to talk about, the archaeologist who is studying the Kaka Beach site is trying to preserve it. And we've been talking to her a lot about the fact that these archaeological sites preserve biodiversity too. And so it's like double bang for the buck. The, you know, if we can convince the local landowners not to cut the forest down over the the archaeological sites because those bats provide ecosystem services that they need and the land isn't really good for them anyway because it's all rocky because of all the buildings <laughs> that are there. And so we're working with them to, to try and build some connections too. I, I have a question about the wing punches. You mm -hmm. said you, you've been using desiccant and yes. that has improved your DNA yes. extraction. Can you talk a little more about that? Well, this I haven't actually done this yet, but Emma Teeling at, um, in, in Dublin, who is the, the grand master of the BAT1K project trying to get you know, whole genomes from many, many, many bat species, um, I've been talking to her about just preservation methods. And so what she's been doing is putting wing punches in desiccant. She says to get higher molecular weight DNA out of that than putting that same wing punch into alcohol or RNA later or lysis buffer or anything else. So we're going to try that this time. Um, we also, when we sacrifice animals, we take all the other tissues too and we preserve them. I've been just flash freezing those lately, not any preservative at all. The real question is what you do with the wing punches. So that's that's the direction we're going with those. Any further questions? Well, thanks very, very much. Thank you.